CEO of Mana Development Group LLC, and he currently holds the area development rights agreement rights for Panera Bread and Bakery Cafes in San Diego, North Los Angeles, and Orange County, California. How many of you have eaten at a Panera Bread lately? Okay, look at that. That's amazing. I'm sure he says, keep eating, keep eating, all right? Um, yes. Uh, he um, has served also on various boards. He serves as the chairman of the, of the board of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. He began working closely with the Grahams, joining Samaritan's Purse Board in 2003, and serving on the executive committee of the San Diego Billy Graham Crusade as well. Um, I got to see him about six years ago, and I shared with him this morning that what he shared uh, then still impacts my life to this day. Um, he bridges his faith and business better than anyone I know. It's a treat, and in fact, he's built his bi business, treat others the way you want to be treated on that motto that is, of course, we know from the scripture. So you're in for a treat today. Can you help me welcome Paul Saber? Well, I get an extra five minutes, I guess, because the video was five minutes long. <laughs> I, after sitting here, I'm not sure why I was invited to speak, because it seems everybody's related to Dr. Jeremiah that's up on the stage today. <laughs> um, so I, I'm related only because uh, I realize my son is a hip-hop artist, um, and uh, he opens for big acts around the country. He opened for Lecrae the other night in Toronto. And so I'm the opening act for Dr. Jeremiah, uh, which I'm uh, very humbled to do and, and honored to do. Um, if you had seen the video, um, the reason I wanted to show the video was because it's, it's really our internal video uh, that we communicate to all the orientations of our employees and through training. Uh, we have about 3,500 employees uh, that facilitate our 70 restaurants uh, from here to Michigan. We have Michigan and Indiana and Southern California. And um, you would have seen in that video really a challenge to each of you because I only speak in the video for about a minute and a half of the four and a half minute video. It's really my employees sharing their heart uh, and sharing their heart, recognizing that what we do uh, is uh, really sharing the gospel to our employees. Although we make bread uh, for a living, uh, our real responsibility is to share the bread of life. And so if you go into any one of my cafes um, on the wall, uh, at some location, at some point in the cafe, you will see a plaque uh, that is dedicated uh, to the Lord and to my brother. And I guess that's where I'd start uh, with you this morning. I know Maria's got, you're going to, where are you, to hold your hand up and tell me what I'm done. Uh, so I said, go just stand up and shout and say, get down. Uh, because I want to hear Dr. Jeremiah as well. So, uh, but I want to I challenge you, I guess, with this thought this morning. Um, and that is every one of us have been given a territory by God. Every one of us. Uh, what Dr. Jeremiah and other pastors around this country and around the world try to do every Sunday or through radio shows or through messaging and other vehicles is to challenge and equip the community that comes into their church to recognize the territory God has given them to go out and make a difference. And I want to challenge you that whatever territory you have, that you give that over to the Lord and trust Him with that territory. And so I would tell you that my story really begins by the fact that I did not have a lot of trust. Uh, I did not have uh, the position uh, and, and the wonderful opportunities I now have because I was not quite as confident in the Lord as I should have been. And so when you go into my cafes, you'll notice that the plaque that's in that cafe is not only uh, a message of the bread of life in John 6.32, but it's also a dedication to my brother. My brother was in the restaurant business. I was in it first, uh, right out of college. And then uh, uh, I was working for my father selling cars. And I said, well, who would do this for a living, Dad? This, is, this might be the worst job in the world. And he said, well, go find something else to do. And, and as the Lord would have it in my pride, I went out and found the restaurant business, which the car business seems like a very good business now. But, um, and so I went out and opened up a little hot dog stand, and my brother was a professional baseball player, and, 
and he would come in uh, in the off season and work about an hour and a half, two hours, and say, this is the greatest business in the world, and then leave. And I would be there for another 14 and a half hours. Uh, but as, as God would have it, I got out of the restaurant business when he got out of baseball, um, and I went to law school. And Mark got into McDonald's. And uh, our plan was that I would eventually get out of law school and, and potentially move to, to where he was in Indiana. But God had a different plan. My brother had led me to Christ. I was the only person in our family that he had led to Christ. And uh, he shared his faith with me, and I ultimately came to Christ. Uh, but um, I didn't live a very godly life. I was living uh, with one foot in the carnal world and one foot uh, in the spiritual world. And as God would have it in my life, he woke me up to that one morning uh, when my brother, his wife, three children, and a babysitter were all filled with car accident. And I had to then facilitate and sell his businesses. Uh, he had one McDonald's at that time. And in that process, I was given the opportunity to get into McDonald's. But prior to that, I made a commitment to the Lord that I would spend the rest of my life recognizing the territory that the Lord gave me. No matter how small it was, I had no idea what the Lord would do with my life. I just knew that at that point, whatever territory I would have, whatever he gave me would be to share the gospel with whoever listened to me. And so we opened up our first restaurant in uh, Atlanta, and God would have it. We became uh, three restaurants and, and uh, ultimately met my wife, got married, uh, moved to Albuquerque. And it was at that point that I recognized that my businesses were not mine at all. They were the Lord's, totally the Lord's. And I think one of the biggest challenges I, I get asked all the time is, how do you put faith in your business life? Well, I don't have a business life. I have a faith life. My tent making just happens to be selling bread. That's it. And that's what I use to share the gospel. But it took me a season or two to recognize that where I would be faithful, the Lord would be more faithful. If I was bold, the Lord would honor me more. And my challenge to you this morning is to honor the Lord. Be faithful in what He has given you, no matter what size of your business, no matter what your role in your business. Part of what you have seen in that video is employees sharing their faith with other employees. We have a thing in our organization called Share the Dough where approximately 20% of our employee base gives part of their paycheck every two weeks to build churches. They've built some 15 churches around the, around the world where they have an, an internal benevolent fund for those who are in need. So use your business to, to share the gospel. And that's become our motto. But again, as I said, that was not always my heart. And as I got into McDonald's and ultimately moved to Albuquerque, where I expanded the company to six McDonald's, I was first impacted on how I could use my business in a totally unique way. Greg Laurie, of which probably most of you know, was expanding outside of Southern California at that point, and he came to New Mexico. He had a good friend there, Skip Heitzig, who was a friend of mine, was the local pastor, and they came to town, and Greg was going to do a small outreach, one of his first outside of California. And I asked a simple question. How do you market this? How do you tell people? Well, we, we use the radio program and we get up in the church and tell people. I said, so the only people that come are people that listen to Christian radio and come to church? And they both sort of looked at me kind of funny. And I, and I said, well, why would anybody do that? That doesn't seem like a very good strategy. And I said, why don't you use my McDonald's to tell people about it? So they said, well, how would you do that? I said, well, let's just pass out flyers to everybody that comes in or is a hamburger. Can you do that? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> and so, so I began to do it. And uh, we passed out coupons in the drive through and on every train liner. We had a whole thing about the festival that was coming, and, and I got a letter in the mail. <laughs> and McDonald's said, you can't do that. And I threw the letter away, and a couple days went by, and I got a phone call. <laughs> and McDonald's said, you can't do that. I said, well, I'm going to keep doing that, what I'm doing. And they said, well, then we're going to have to delicense you. Well, I was at a crossroads in the territory God gave me. I had a franchisor that had every right to be franchised. So I chose to keep going. And we gave out about 150,000 flyers in, uh, to people. And by the time the festival came and went, I figured that the legal action that they would need to take, the whole thing would have been over by then, as it was. And I was called into McDonald's, and they said, Paul, you can't use your business to proselytize the people that are coming in to buy a Big Mac. 
I said, well, I wasn't. I was just giving them an opportunity if they chose to go. And so some years later, Franklin Graham came to Albuquerque. What's interesting is because of our, deci our decision to be bold for Christ and just to use our business for Him, for the Lord. It's not our business. It's His business. Everything we have is, have is His. Then when Billy and Franklin came to town, once again, now I had 14 McDonald's, I decided well, I'm going to convert every billboard on I-25 and I-40 and talk about it. I, I own the billboards, I thought. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and now we were going to do tray liners and it would be about a million tray liners and bag stuffers in the drive through Well, as you can imagine, I received a phone call uh, from McDonald's. And McDonald's asked me what the cost of doing this was. And I told them, they said, we'd like to pay for it. I did nothing else but honor the Lord in the territory God gave me, and God honored my boldness. See, I had a spirit of fear, but that fear didn't go away. I still, even though I saw these things happen in my life when I stepped off the curb to the Lord, I still had a spirit of fear. Some years later, I was elected uh, to the chairmanship of the licensing community for McDonald's Corporation, some 2,700 operators that I oversaw as a volunteer. And I was the youngest chairman that they had ever had at that point, and I was challenged by a very dear friend of mine, uh, Harry, to run for this position. I said, Harry, I'll never be elected. First of all, uh, you know, I talk about Jesus too much according to everybody up here, and, and, uh, and he was a strong believer. He said, no, I want you to run. I think you'll do great. I said, you should run. Everybody respects you. He was a lot like Dr. Jeremiah. And uh, he said, no, you run. So my wife and I prayed about it. We decided, well, what kind of an impact could I make in this company if I did this? And ultimately, I decided to run. I was elected. And the morning that uh, I was going to speak in front of about 10 or 15,000 McDonald's family and, and, and members uh, accepting and, and talking about my vision for the next several years, my wife and I had prayed that I would open that meeting in prayer. And that had never been done before at McDonald's Corporation. And so we were all prayed up. My pastor was praying for me, Skip Heitzig. And, and I went off to <coughs> Chicago to kick off the meeting. And as I was praying that morning, I, I don't hear voices from the Lord, uh, but that morning I heard a voice say, don't do it today. And I, and I remember exactly when he did it, because if you remember back in the day when you had clocks in the hotel, they used to flip. Uh, and this clock flipped. And it said 7-Eleven. And so at 7.15, 7.20, my wife called and Diane said, uh, are you all ready? I said, yeah, I'm all ready. She said, I've been praying for you all morning. And are you nervous? I said, no, I, I'm okay. Oh, you're not nervous to pray? Primarily Jewish company. Obviously very corporate. I said, well, interesting you asked that because the Lord had put it on my heart not to pray today. It's a you know, complete pause on the other end of the phone. Yeah. She said, that's funny. He hasn't given me that same thing. <laughs> I said, that's why you're home and I'm in charge. <laughs> and so so I, I said, so, so you just need to be praying for this tough thing to say in a room full of women. Uh, and so I said, you just need to be praying that God will give me another opportunity somewhere down the field to do this. Because today is not the day. Now one of the gentlemen from McDonald's Corporation, who's one of my dearest friends, a very joyful guy, very happy guy, Christian guy, um, full of life, always happy, was walking towards me, getting ready to take me into the uh, convention center where I was going to speak, and uh, I could tell that he was not his normal self. And he walked up to me and said, uh, Paul, I, I, I just feel terrible. I said, Ray, what, what's the matter with you? You're always happy. He said, I just feel terrible for you today. I said, why do you feel terrible? He said, well, I don't know how to tell you this, and I feel bad that it's your first meeting and you've got to start this meeting with this news. I said, what news? He said, Harry died this morning. The gentleman that encouraged me to run had died of a massive heart attack that morning. I said, when did you hear this news? How did you hear this? He said, at 7-Eleven, his wife called me. I said, Ray, don't worry, I know how to start the meeting. The Lord gave me an opportunity to open a prayer, which I did for the next six and a half years. We watched countless people give their lives to Christ within that organization. 
What is your territory that God has given you? We have a tendency to believe because the culture tells us and the business community tells us that we cannot share our faith. We cannot express what we know. In my 58 years of life, and I'm sure every generation has felt it, and Dr. Jeremiah has just written a book that can probably validate it, we are close, closer to the end than we have ever been before. There is an urgency that is pressing in on us like never before. We are watching Christians beheaded. I just returned from Canada this weekend where a pastor like Dr. Jeremiah could not get up and preach out of Romans 1. We are in perilous times. The church cannot, within its four walls, facilitate the need for the urgency. It's the territory that God has given the Christian to impact the globe. I don't know how much time we'll have to do it. Panera, when I first put the plaque up, or proposed to put the plaque up in Escondido, said to me, you can't put that plaque up. I said, well, well why not? Well, because you have a gospel verse on the bottom of that plaque. I said, I'm glad you recognize that. You know what I mean? <laughs> And in fact, the, the, the chairman of the company said, well, Paul, you, you just can't do that. I said, do you understand that verse? He said, well, it doesn't matter what the verse is. I said, Ron, you're a strong Jewish man. Jesus Christ is referencing your prophet and lawgiver, Moses. I, I, Paul, you still can't put that plaque up. Well, as you can imagine, uh, we put the plaque up. Um, and... Panera sent me a letter. <laughs> when we opened up our Carlsbad Cafe, they sent me another letter. Because I was going around their company to get them made. By the time we opened the third cafe, they said, let us do them for you. We have to become more honest about our faith. Those of us in the business community must understand we are not to parse our faith. We are to share our faith. We are not to try to figure out when is the most appropriate time. And some of you may sit here and say, well, yeah, but you're the owner of the company. You can do whatever you want. I'm a franchisee. I've just explained to you. I have the weight of a franchise over the size of McDonald's that could have squashed me like a grape. But he who is in me is greater who's running McDonald's. <laughs> And it took me several years to realize the bolder I become, the more God honors me with territory. We can choose to have a small territory anywhere in Scripture where we see a man who is limited by territory. It's because he's been limited by his faith and trust in the Lord. Peter is a perfect example for that. Peter was the one given the message to go to the Gentile world. Was it Peter who did it? He stalled. He questioned it. God brought Paul into our lives. God will use someone in your territory if you are unwilling to do it. We are in an urgent time. I have some 3,500 employees. The first ministry I have in my life is my family. The second is my business. 3,500 employees with a turnover ratio of about 75% a year. That means I get the opportunity to see about 4,400 people a year. We get to touch those people. They are a microcosm of society. They are absolutely as lost as anyone on the planet. They're comprising every level of diversity that exists in our culture. Yet we tell them in orientation as we open a cafe, I typically will go in and pray with them and say, you need to understand where you now work. You work first and foremost for an organization that put Christ at the top of everything we do. Now, what does that mean for you as a young person or a mother going back to work or a father who has had tough times hit and you find yourself working behind the counter of a restaurant? What does that mean for you? It means we're going to do our best to protect you and keep you in an environment that has no foul language, that honors what we tell you we will do, and that we will always be your first line of defense when you're in trouble. 
because we believe deeply that the Lord and Savior who is in us needs to be shared with you. My prayer for each of you as an employee is that you would come to know our Lord and Savior, but we're not here to proselytize you, but we are here to make the opportunity available to you because every one of you at some point in your life will get to a place of hopelessness. That's my first ministry. My entire team functions that way. And how has God hired that team? I have one of my ex-employees here, Miss DC. So you can talk to her, not, not see anymore. She's been married since she worked for me. Uh, but you can go up to her and ask her, is that guy, he doesn't really do all that. <laughs> She'll probably tell you, I never saw any of that stuff. <laughs> so how, how do we do that? How do we try to live that out? How has the Lord honored that? The beauty of coming to San Diego is I put a stake in the ground much bolder than I had ever had for McDonald's. Because every time I thought I was bold, I chickened out. And then the Lord verified for me that he would honor me. But when I came to San Diego, I made the decision to put a stake in the ground. That our company would always be about Jesus Christ. Not just in what we say we're about, but in what we do. And everything we do. First and foremost is about the gospel. Everything we do with our employees is about Jesus Christ. How we counsel them, how we deal with their problems, how we deal with people that steal from us comes from the scriptures. And what has the Lord done? I was sitting in a room the other day with my leadership team of 24 people. 19 of them are born again. I didn't lead any one of them to Christ except my brother in law. God brought me people into the territory to expand my territory because I've been faithful in the territory that he gave me. Are you faithful with the territory God has given you? Ask yourself that question today. Why are you here today? You're here because according to your mission of this breakfast is how do we, bridge build, how do we, how do we build bridges across to those who don't know Christ? How do we use what God has given us to impact those who don't know our Savior. I walked around outside, and I'll conclude with this. And I looked at all the wonderful things that are taking place around these 501c3s. I'm involved in several 501c3s. They're wonderful. They're necessary. But at the end of the day, no matter how much we help someone get out of the gutter of life or whatever the blows of life have dealt them, if we don't give them Jesus Christ, we've given them nothing but a temporal pause. Our responsibility is to be the hands and the feet and the heart of the church. Our responsibility is to take the messages from wonderful, gifted, anointed men like David Jeremiah and push it out. Because it is coming more and more against us we should be so persecuted. We should have so much opposition in our business that the only way you know you're succeeding is not by your ability, not by your talent, not by your stewardship, not how well you plan, not well how, how well you do a three-year strategy, but because Jesus Christ is in charge. We should be organizations that are being talked about in a negative way by the culture we are in. Well, how do they get away with that? Well, I don't know how they do that. But much more we should be excited when we meet someone like Misty's father for the first time. And his father and her father tells me, you have no idea the impact you made on my daughter and how you prepared her for what she now does. Allow God to expand your territory Allow him to take what little you have, whatever it is. You may have a lot, but it's never as much as what God wants to give you. Use it for his purposes. Use it to share the gospel. We are in urgent, urgent time. Amen? Amen. Thanks.